our first SIG session for this evening. My name is Mimi, and I will be your MC for today. And for this session, the speakers will deliver his presentation, followed with a Q&A. For your information, this session will also be broadcasted on our online platforms for our online participants. To those who are watching this broadcast session on your gadgets, feel free to ask your questions in the comment section. As the, MC, the moderator will collect the questions for the panel speakers. All right, before our session commences, allow me to introduce our esteemed speakers for this evening. First, we have with us today, we are honored to have with us today, Associate Professor Dr. Ramesh Nahi. And uh, Dr. Ramesh has taught English in both urban and rural schools before joining University of Technology Mara, where he is an Associate Professor at the Academy of Language Studies. In recent years, he has collaborated on research projects evaluating English language education reform programs in Malaysia. He is a member of the English Language Standards and Quality Council Ministry of Education Malaysia and also the president of the Malaysian English Language Teaching Association. Next, we have with, with us today Dr. Abdullah bin Muhammad Nawi, a senior lecturer at University of Technology Malaysia and Dr. Abdullah has taught and trained English and communication to students from a diverse range of ages and nationalities for more than 20 years. From middle school students to CEOs of companies spanning across three countries, namely the UK, New Zealand and Malaysia. Dr. Abdullah was also the, one of the specialists who designed the CEFR Online Muet and is intimately involved with Majlis Purpose at Malaysia in the running of the Malaysian University English Test Muet and the now completed CEFR readiness test in many different functions, as well as training of examiners all over the country. All present, also, oh, sorry, at present, he is also a member of the English Language Standards and Quality Council Ministry of Education. Okay, uh, without further delay, the topic for our speaker tonight uh, is assessment in current times and its way forward. Moving along, without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. T. Vanita Tanabalan to moderate this session. Over to you, Dr. Vanita. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mimi. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very good evening on behalf of the organizing committee. I would like to invite everyone to this SIG session, special interest uh, group session tonight. And this group will specifically talk about assessment. So now, um, education is a dynamic process. It's evolving and everything along in education is also evolving. Our curriculum, our content, our pedagogies, and most importantly, assessment. So thus, tonight we are going to talk about current practices in assessment. And together with us, we have two esteemed um, speakers who are really involved in assessment. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Nair from UITM, sorry, UITM. And also together with us, we have Dr. Abdullah from UTM. So I would like to start the session today by asking Dr. Ramesh if he can share with us on um, the role of formative assessment and summative assessment in ELT. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vanita. Uh, the introduction of the new curriculum about six, five, six years ago really brought to the fore uh, a focus on formative assessments. Uh, every teacher, English language teacher, is trained to assess student performance uh, both formatively and summatively. And essentially, a form formative assessment has to, de has to do with how teachers make use of information to improve the classroom practices, how, how better to, to teach a certain item, language item, let's say. So as a lesson is carried out, a teacher is constantly looking for evidence of whether the content of that lesson is delivered effectively. And certain things work, certain things don't work. As, as classroom practitioners, we're constantly trying 
we, we are researchers, right? We're constantly identifying issues and we're trying to address those issues. And formative assessments serve to do just that, to help teachers ascertain to what extent the delivery of their lesson has been, been effective. Summative assessments are assessments which I think really uh, dominate the Malaysian uh, education landscape. So you have, you know, um, mid-year exams, you have, uh, you had the, the UPSR and the PT3 exams, and you have the SPM, and they serve a very important role as well, right? As, as a summative assessment, for one, it provides the students themselves, the learners, with feedback on where they are uh, in terms of having mastered content of, of the subject. It also serves to inform uh, decision makers, uh, let's say the Ministry of Education, for example, on how successful uh, the syllabus has been in, in uh, ensuring that the students uh, are proficient in the language. So, you know, when we had the, uh, the, the UPSR exam at the end of uh, six years, that should have been the purpose of uh, summative assessment, to ascertain to what extent uh, the students have, uh, you know, have been successful at uh, receiving all that knowledge over the six years. Um, so that's, that's essentially the role of, of the formative and summative assessments. When the new curriculum was introduced, the CFR informed curriculum, uh, all teachers had to undergo four main uh, training programs, one of which was formative assessment. And the reason formative assessment was so central uh, in the implementation of the new curriculum was because there was this um, uh, awareness or realization that teachers had to constantly be looking at their classroom practices and, you know, uh, kind of formalizing the way they evaluated the effectiveness of their lessons, uh, took note of you know, what needed to be improved for the next lesson or for the, next, the following topic, and so on and so forth. And I think that is why uh, formative assessments have now uh, become uh, you know, uh, more, more prominent in the ELT classrooms. At least that is what we hope uh, in, our, in our schools. That's interesting. So coming, focusing on formative assessment, uh, you and I know as trainers, as, uh, as educators, there are a lot of misconceptions down there among the teachers. Dr. Abdullah, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vanita. That's a, that's a very good question, and I'd like to begin to answer that by not just focusing on misconceptions uh, by the teachers, but rather misconceptions <laughs> uh, as a whole. In fact, there are so many misconceptions everywhere. And I want to ask people in the audience and I want to ask people online, what are the things that you hear people say about testing? Now, if you recall 10 years back, it was too many tests, too many tests. Students are burnt out, too many tests. Let's abolish this, let's abolish that. You guys remember that? And there was a big hullabaloo. Yes, let's abolish. And then you had one cap. No, don't abolish. Let's abolish. And uh, what happened? We abolished the, was it UPSR first, was it? It was UPSR first. And we abolished that and... The, um, the people who were against the standardized assessments, they were going, yay, that's a big win for us. And then we went up to, and if you remember, you had SRP and then PMR, and you could see that the next agenda was that. So what happened then? Again, there was a big uh, target painted on PMR, and then boom, and uh, PMR was shut down and it was changed to PT3. So everyone remembers this, everyone, uh, do you remember how you felt when PT3 happened? I think a lot of, the, the, there was a lot of negative reaction as well as positive. 
you've had a lot of people saying that now it has fallen down to the school, now the teachers have to do it, there's more work on the teacher. And there was that big central question of how do you make sure that every teacher tests every student the same? Now this is something that we need to unpack a little more. I'm gonna come back to that later because that's definitely part of one of the issues that we have about formative assessments. So then we had, and then we abolished that as well. <laughs> so right now, it's pretty much no exams right up until SPM. And then STPM is still there. Uh, <laughs> we don't know what's gonna happen, but uh, we hope that there's not going to be uh, an anti-SPM -SP movement. Now, Recently, I don't know about you, but I've been reading a lot of misinformation online, especially WhatsApp. And um, Dr. Ramesh, have you heard the newest uh, thing going around where people are saying that, um, that the abolishment of standardized testing is agenda Yahudi? So we, have you heard that? I'm pretty sure you haven't, yep. And there are some people going around saying that this is, again, I'm, I'm repeating what, what is out there. This is agenda of the non-Malays untuk tidak pandaikan, untuk menjadikan Melayu bodoh. I'm not kidding. There's WhatsApp messages going around doing that. And now, people are going like, we have no tests. You're making them stupid. There's nothing for them to learn. There's nothing, there's no, there's no target for them. So they're happy being stupid. So this is where we have this tension where you have, on the one hand, you have people who are saying testing is good. But on the other hand, you have people who are saying testing is bad. Now, I've got a question for everybody here, especially for people who are, who say that um, testing, too much testing is bad. I want to ask you, if you go to, if you, if you, if you want to have surgery, you're going to have surgery, and the doctor who comes to you and says, I'm going to cut you up, what's the first thing that you want to ask him? Are you qualified? Did you take so-and-so exam? Did you take this specialist exam? Did you pass your exam well? How did you do? So it comes back to that. So whatever it is, whatever myth or misconception you follow, if you study that trend, there is always going to be a need for testing. Otherwise, any Tom, Dick, and Harry can claim to be anything they want without needing to be tested. So testing is a necessary evil. So we always hear that, right? But how about if we change that paradigm? This is one of the misconceptions. One of the misconceptions is testing is evil. I do, that's generally what it is, right? People are saying people are afraid of tests. So what we want to change is Testing is not an evil, but it is actually something good. And now we start to unpack the differences between formative and summative assessment. For formative assessment especially, this is going to be how the teachers fine tune the development of the students. However, this does not mean that summative assessment is bad because you need to have summative assessment. There needs to be a standard that you need to achieve. If you don't achieve this, then you don't achieve whatever it is that you are going to do. So I'm just starting the ball rolling on misconceptions and I'm repeating here that testing is not a necessarily necessary evil We've got to change that to testing is a necessary good. <laughs> Back to you, Dr. Okay, B. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Yeah, um, 
I think here, the misconception that we are talking about, about assessment is uh, more to the practice in assessment. Uh, I think what teachers um, are struggling with is how they need to relate formative to summative assessment. And I think realizing this, what the ministry is doing, has done now is the new policy of Pentaksiran berasaskan sekolah, pemerkasaan pentaksiran berasaskan sekolah. We have actually brought in both domains, the formative as well as summative. Formative is like you know, it's supporting the summative at the end. So we all know in assessment that's necessary. What we are doing actually now is going away from rote learning because we realise that our students they need to perform in PISA in international standard kind of assessment. So they need to have these critical thinking skills. So we need to do that. And the only way to do this, uh, to come to that uh, outcome is to give them the, um, the practice. And this can all, only be done formatively. So that's why we need to have our syllabus. Our curriculum is actually aligned. And interestingly, for English, we have the CFR, Common European Framework of Reference. And uh, we all work towards reaching the standards in CFR. Now, uh, the question I think all sectors will be interested now from uh, students, teachers, the community at large, parents. How do we make this as a culture that you need to understand that we are not taking away exam from you. What we are doing now is preparing them to, to, to reach out to the world, to, to play their role in the market. That's how they, we need to prepare them. So that's what we are doing. That's why we are bringing in formative assessment. And this is the practice in most countries. Yeah? So, yeah, Dr. Ramesh. Yeah. Um. I think the, the doing away with the uh, UPSR and the uh, PT3 exam does not mean that we've done away with summative assessments. It's there, right? It's going to take on a, a, a different form. Uh, I think from a logistics perspective, it's probably going to ease, hopefully ease the burden on the, the system. Um, I am personally cautiously optimistic about the doing away with, with the with the uh, UPSR exam, at least for, for English language, because uh, there, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? I, we, we, as classroom practitioners, do we really need to wait until the student sits for the UPSR before we know where the student is in terms of uh, his or her proficiency? I think um, as we take a student through the year, and now with the CFR-informed curriculum, a teacher using professional judgment and training would be able to ascertain whether the child is at, uh, you know, A2 for uh, listening, uh, A2 for speaking, so on and so forth. And so we are kind of uh, empowering or returning the power to the teachers to, to make that professional call. But of course, the summative assessments are important and it's going to be there. Uh, as I said just now, uh, they, they serve a very important role. The problem has been, and you talk about, you, you ask this question about this culture, you know, and, and, and what we're in. If anything, the UPSR exam, for example, what it has done is it has fed an entire industry, right? Uh, tuition classes, uh, book publications, uh, book, book publishers were all very happy with these assessments because they could, you know, uh, st parents used to send uh, children to ensure that the child achieves an A in uh, the, the English paper, let's say, in, in UPSR. But what did that translate into? That's, that's the more important question. You know, uh, when the child receives an A, and we've seen this happen in our education system, even at the SPM level, when a student is awarded an A, you have people questioning the value of that A. And so, uh, what we are hoping now with the introduction of the new curriculum and, you know, uh, the focus on all four skills that there is now a, a more accurate way of describing the capacity of a student across the four skills. Um, but what needs to also happen is that we need to educate society about this change. 
And I, you know, the, the SPM results which came out recently, for example, had students you know, uh, being provided with, with grades across the four skills and the CFR levels. I think teachers, I'm, I'm speculating here because I'm not in school, but teachers are probably having a tough time kind of explaining to parents uh, about what this new way of assessment is. Um, I think there needs to be, a, I don't know, a more uh, effective way of disseminating information about this, these changes to support our teachers in schools and also to make parents aware about this, uh, this need uh, to, to uh, or rather to explain what the CFR aligned assessment is and at the same time assure parents that just because the UPSR exam is no more in that, that form that we have known it to be does not mean we have abandoned uh, assessing students and reporting the performance of students. Uh, I, th I think that there's that distinction that needs to be made. But I'm really hopeful that with the doing away with, with of, of the uh, UPSR exam, for example, in primary schools, if there are primary school teachers out here, if there's, any, if there's any subject which does not have to focus so much on assessments, it is the English language and maybe the Malay language, because what's our business? Our business is to ensure that the students are proficient in the language. Let the assessment take care of itself. Let the students sit for any assessment, any proficiency assessment, be it the, the uh, you know, uh, our local assessments or international assessments, if our focus is on helping the child develop uh, his or her skills in listening, speaking, reading and writing, we can't go wrong, right? And now that we have the, the, the new uh, syllabus which tells the teacher that your, your student should be able to do this, 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 you know, your learning standards, and you, as a teacher, are able to ascertain that at the end of the year and pass that information on to the teacher the following year, I think we are, we are fine. You know, uh, we don't... You know, when we had the UPSR exam, what purpose did it serve, especially for, for English? I know that it was used for students who were applying to go for uh, residential schools. I think they, they looked at that. But how many students actually apply to go for residential, uh, to, to go to residential schools? What other purpose did it serve? I'm sure it served to inform the ministry and policy makers on, on decisions. But beyond that, I think it was more for parents to compare with each other how many A's their, their, their child got and the kind of stress that the children went through. I know of schools where night classes are held in the run up to the UPSR for crying out loud. And these are, these are you know, young children. So I, I'm, like I said, I'm cautiously optimistic, and I'm hopeful that, that this brings about some positive changes in the ELT classroom. Thank you. That's interesting, and also you said something about making professional judgment. Now, this, this is something that I think we need to think about very seriously, because um, teachers seem to be struggling uh, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, making their professional judgment. It's, it has become a, a practice where, you know, you just g indicate the levels uh, as required by uh, the administration sometimes, and because you are rushed for time, so you just indicate the level. And by indicating that level, you call yourself that you're making a professional judgment. I think professional judgment is beyond that. I think you need to be assessment literate. And uh, when we are shifting from, we are doing this shifting from formative to summative, and then uh, now we are talking about, yeah, we need to do the test at the end of the six months and, and the end of the year, and you're now you're saying, oh, you're now thinking, talking about summative. This shifts that we are doing in this, you know, in this uh, assessment, I think this is what which is creating the confusion among teachers. Honestly, because I'm a trainer myself and I see that. So which brings me to this next question. How do we actually educate or rather develop this literacy, this assessment literacy among our teachers? Anyone would like to take on this question? Maybe I'll just quick, quickly share, share my thoughts on this. I remember um, when uh, the first round of training was done with the introduction of the new curriculum, 
um, and I sat in through those training sessions. And, you know, uh, I remember the trainers playing uh, videos of students uh, speaking. And the, the participants had to ascertain whether they would assess that, that particular candidate as, you know, at, at A1 or A2, so on and so forth, you know. And most of us got it wrong, right? And I think this is about, you know, we are settling now. Of course, it's been, it's been now six years. It does take time for teachers to wrap their minds around, for one, this focus on all four skills, which in itself is quite uh, a departure from practices in the past. Because we were so uh, focused on summative assessments, like the SPM and, and the, the, the PT3 and, and UPSR, a lot of, I'm not saying all teachers were doing this, but we were essentially teaching to the test, right? Because that is how the student was being assessed, and that's how teachers were being assessed and judged by parents, by school administrators, and so on and so forth. Um, so now with this shift and this focus on all four skills, sure, it's going to take time for teachers to be comfortable and to be able to confidently ascertain whether the, the student you know, in a particular assessment uh, is at, at A2 or is at A1. Um, and I think teachers have been receiving training and will continue to receive. But also let's keep in mind one of the benefits of ha us having a curriculum which is informed by the CFR is that we are now part of a global community of ELT practitioners, right? There are many countries where teachers are drawing on the CFR and we now speak a universal language. And, you know, uh, the younger teachers are very much, uh, you know, uh, exposed to, to a lot of information which is, which is uh, uh, available on the internet on how to carry out assessments. And I think there are videos as well. And, you know, that should be part of your continuing professional development. And, you know, I hope that that is the case. The teachers are constantly in contact and in communication about how to effectively assess, particularly skills like uh, speaking and, and, of course, all the other skills as well. Okay. Yeah. So, moving a bit further from what we have discussed, we have discussed so far, let's look at the population, the complexities that we have in the country. At one end, we have this rural-urban disparity. At the other end, we also have this disparity of you know, we have children coming from the, uh, you know, the D40, uh, children from, children are from the uh, refugees. Uh, we have so much of complexities in this, uh, I mean, in Malaysia. Now, how do we reach to a standard assessment? Meaning to say that we are all moving towards one goal. We want to produce our students to, you know, so that they are marketable once they leave school. Now, with these complexities, how do we, uh, we are already struggling with this policy of uh, coming up with formative assessment and making teachers understand, making teachers literate enough to conduct assessment in the classroom. But we also have the other complexities around us. How do we um, come up to a standardized kind of uh, assessment. Yeah, Dr. Abdullah, would you like to? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. V. This is one of the, the most difficult questions of all time when you talk about trying to develop an assessment system. First of all, we have to realize that there is no uh, uh, Dr. Aslam previously said there is no one hat fits all. So that's what he said. And that's basically what it is. There is nothing there that can accommodate 100% of the people. There's always going to be a bell curve. No matter what, you're gonna have, you're gonna have outliers, you're gonna have the people who are gonna be marginalized simply because you cannot pitch assessment the same way to every single Malaysian. And this is something which is prevalent throughout the whole world. 
Now, there are, there are a few ways of, of doing this, and they all involve a compromise. I think that that's, that's the whole idea of this. Where can you do the most good? Where is the focus that the ministry or the government or the people want to see? That's where the assessment is going to be pitched. Now, there, there, there's so much based on this. Now, but I'd like to draw your attention to perhaps somewhere beyond our shores. So, I want to ask the audience, which country have you heard is legendary in the field of education right now? Like, the best education system. Anybody? Come on, come on. I, I, I want to hear. I want to hear some voices. Finland. That's right. Finland. Finland is uh, at somewhere at the top. Now, Finland has been um, crowned by some people. Why I say some people? Actually, if you have a look at the uh, education ranking of the world's best education systems, Finland is not number one. It isn't. If you, if you have a look at the ranking, Finland is at number 15. The US is number one, and the UK is number two. So this is a little bit of a myth there, but there are some people who accredit Finland with having the best system. And they do have a very, very good system. I'm not trying to take anything away from that. But I just want to tell you um, a little bit about how Finland manages to do this. Um, number one, there is no standardized test at school. So it's not like there are some, you know, at the end of the semester, six months, no. There's no standardized testing at all. But then again, doesn't that lead to the question, how do you know they're any good? This is the part where it gets interesting. For us in Malaysia, testing is mandatory, right? When you reach that certain age, you have to take SPM. You have to take this, you have to take that. Now, in Finland, their system is everything is determined by the teachers in the class. This is the amazing part. And then you ask yourself, but then again, if everything is done through the teachers, how, how do the teachers know that they're any good? This is the other part. Every Finnish teacher has a master's degree. Every single one. And in Finland, the profession of teaching is seen as prestigious as being a doctor or a lawyer. In fact, it's one of the highest paid professions there. Can you imagine if, if uh, in Malaysia, people, people say, Chegu, 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 wow. I mean, a long time ago, it used to be Chegu and Chegu. People respected because of the culture. But then again, if it was like talking about money, <laughs> Chegu. <laughs> it's a different song. <laughs> but over there, that's how the teachers know they can do a good job because they are trained. We talk about training. So training is essential, and there's a lot to unpack there as well. But the point that I'm trying to come that, that I'm trying to bring across is, is that it falls to the teacher to carry out formative assessments all throughout school, and to answer the question. But how do you ensure the quality? The Finns the, take an optional exam. And that exam is called the, fin the Finnish Matriculation Exam. And what it is, is basically, if you want to enter university, you take the exam, you pass that, you get into university. It is not mandatory. But when this happens, as you can see, that there is less pressure 
the students learn what they need to learn, but then again, at the end of it, we, would, we heard Dr. Ramesh talking about how people study to the test. There is an element of that within the Finnish education system, but the focus is totally different. The focus is to get into university. So the pressure during the formative years as a, uh, uh, as a school student, you're not thinking about tests. It's only towards the end there. So if you want to compare that to what's happening in the US, the US is a very difficult country to talk about simply because there is no national education system. We can't just say this is happening in the US. In the US, education falls to the school districts. They have absolute power. Whatever they want to do, they want to carry out the test, they want to do this, do that, that that's what happens. But they must be doing something right for them to get number one in the world. But what I would like to talk about here additionally is in the UK, do you think that the UK is uh, more formative or summative based? The UK actually is very much summative based. In fact, if you have a look at in, in the past, if you studied in university in the UK, you would take one final exam. Whereas in the US, it's more of the assignments which build up. So there's that formative versus the summative. In the UK, you have uh, two SATs as well. And they are, the SATs in, in the UK, they are not the same as the SAT in, in, the, in the US. For the SATs in the UK, you will have, you will have it it's standardized, and the first one you're going to have it is in key stage two, if I'm mistaken, and the other one is in key stage four, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody correct me if, if, I, if I get this, this wrong. You have these standardized tests, and you also have classroom-based tests. So the UK as well is very much assessment based, if you can see there. Now, for people who say do away with assessments, follow the US, for, for the US it's also the same. You, what, what's the standardized test? The SATs, you take that, for the US you have the SATs, the test, the TOEFL, to, 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 and the ACT, American College Test. Basically, these are the three standardized tests that most people take. Other than that, no standardized tests. So some people say, let's move towards that. But don't forget also that you have education systems that have standardized testing, which is in the UK. Which one should we follow in Malaysia? What's the way forward? That's still up for debate, but we need to make sure that we are part of the conversation. We need to make sure that we benchmark ourselves, not just within ourselves, but beyond our shores. Thank you very much. Thank Debbie. you. Yeah. So, yeah, um, Dr. Abdullah, you shared what uh, the practice in Finland and also US is. They are like at two different parts of the continuum. In Finland, it's more of like Malaysia where you, you know, you have the uh, examination board there, okay, one central examination board, which takes care of exam at the end of the term. Well, while in uh, the US, the system is central, decentralized. Every district has got its own education system, exam systems. I think what we can observe what's growing in Malaysia, or rather developing in Malaysia, is that it's something similar to what's happening in Finland. That we are looking at formative, supporting finally, this, eventually coming to a summative, the performance at the end of the year. So this is what we can like, sort of observe what's happening in the country now. My, my question is, Dr. Ramesh, if you remember, sometime during the pandemic and after the pandemic, when the, the shifts that I was talking about just now, 
when we took away PT3 and the UPSR from the, you know, from the school system and say, you know, we're not going to have this high stake assessment. We are going to go for alternatives. So there was this hue and cry among teachers saying that, oh, children are not coming to school anymore. They're not coming to school because there's no exam. This is a nationwide kind of uh, uh, story, kind of uh, an issue uh, that teachers were worried. It's not the parents, you know, it's what the, it, was the te it was the teachers. The teachers were saying that, you know, we don't have exam in the school, we are not going to get our students to come to come. What do you have to say about that, Dr. Ramesh? <laughs> well, you know, uh, it's a sad state of affairs when, when students are coming, you know, for lessons just to prepare for, for an exam. And again, if I keep the focus on English language uh, education, um, our job is to ensure that the students are proficient in the language. The students have to have this awareness. I'm sure they have this awareness themselves that they need the language uh, for furthering the education or for, you know, employability somewhere down the line. You know, I'm sure a child in, in, in primary six is not thinking of employment and is not really thinking of perhaps even, even a university education. But I think what should keep a child coming to school is, is uh, you know, uh, lessons, uh, teachers who are engaged and, and lessons which uh, they look forward to and not because they are targeting an A for, for a particular exam. Uh, you, you gave an example of how, uh, you know, uh, there are, in certain parts of the country, students who are really struggling with English, whereas there are other students who are highly proficient in English. And I don't think we can doctor assessments to, to meet, uh, it's, or it's not even our business to do that. Uh, you know, to meet the, the needs of students of different uh, levels of proficiency. I come back to that point which I made just now. Uh, let the assessments, if this is a proficiency assessment, let the assessment take care of itself. If I am teaching in a school where I was, for example, I was teaching in a school in Jenka, in, in Pahang, where, you know, students uh, were not as proficient as they, they should be. Um, with the new curriculum now, and with the you know, can-do statements, a teacher is able to now describe more accurately, rather than say, oh, this child is good, this child is average, this child is weak. The teacher is now able to say that, all right, this child is at A2 and should be actually now in, in B1. And so we begin speaking a universal language, and that communication between teachers is very important if we are to see any success coming out from this change in, in our new curriculum. This communication among teachers as students pass from one level to the next is vital. It is not the primary six teacher who bears the brunt or receives the glory, you know, uh, when, when a student does well in, in uh, a high stakes exam. Every teacher from primary one up to primary six is accountable. You know the reality out there. We've, we, if you're teaching in form, uh, you know, you're receiving students in form one, and, a, and you, you face students who can't communicate at all in English, right? What do we do? We blame the primary school teachers, right? From primary one up, somewhere it went wrong. And now we end up with a, with a student in, in form one who can't read, who can't speak. Right? That's been the issue in our system for years. My hope is that this stops, or this has stopped, because we're already now about five or six years down the line. When a student moves, let's say, from primary three to primary four, the student should be at an A1 high, A2 low, thereabouts, and so that teacher's accountable, right? And when the student moves, my hope is that when the student moves from primary three to primary four, that information is shared with the teacher who receives that child. And if the student is not where the child needs to be, then the receiving teacher will then have to come up with, and we have this already, right, your, your remedial activities, to bring the child back to where the child needs to be. And if you have a whole year to address that, the child should come back to where the, the child needs to be, I would think. If the child is still struggling, 
then perhaps there are other issues which need to be looked at. Maybe the child has some other issues which does not, any average child should be able to, with support, with the right support, be able to be where he or she needs to be. That's the hope, that's the aspiration. So we don't end up in a situation where students are coming in in Form 1 who cannot read, who cannot write, and the Form 1 teacher has really, is really helpless, and doesn't know, you know where to start. Um, so, you know, I, I think I've gone off tangent a little bit, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but I just had to get that off my mind. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, you spoke about employability, Dr. Ramesh, something very interesting. I would like to pick up on that. Uh, when you talk about employability, now with this advancement in technology and, you know, in this digital era that we are in, new jobs are being created. And let me tell you, in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, we don't know what kind of employability that we need to cater to. Now, that brings me to the question of the syllabus. Let's talk about this post-secondary syllabus. Is there a need for us to um, conceptualize the syllabus that can cater for the employment like in 10 years' time. Meaning to say, I'm saying that, do we need to uh, still have our post-secondary tailored towards, uh, you know, assessment like MUET kind of assessment? Or do we need to move away so that, you know, we think of what the future needs are? So I'm actually uh, throwing this question back to Dr. Ramesh and also both Dr. Abdullah as well, but I think Dr. Abdullah is a bit angry over this question. <laughs> right, so yeah, over to you. Okay, so when you talk about post-secondary, we're talking about Form 6, we're talking about matriculation uh, and, uh, and IPGs as well, right? They, they, they take in students after SPM. I would think that at SPM, a student who, who leaves secondary school with an SPM is either going to do one of two things, either go on to pursue the further education or go into the employment market, right? We'll go into the job market. So the SPM English paper is, well, it, it, it is now uh, informing up to C1, I understand, right? Uh, but it is not uh, an accurate assessment of C1 because the exam itself is pitched at B1, right? That's the aspirational target for, for SPM English. So at B1, we know what someone who's at B1 can do with the language. So if someone is choosing to go into the employment market at B1, this is the other thing. We talk about educating parents. I think employers also need to be educated about this, this change in our education system. They should be able to read and decipher uh, the SPM certificates. I'm talking about yeah. in the context of English. Yeah. Now, if a student chooses to do a post-secondary education, meaning to do Form 6 or to do matriculation, that is an academic track already. The student aspires to move on to university. I don't think people go into post-secondary education then to leave and, and go into the, the, the job market. The aspiration is to move on to university, hence the reference to Form 6 as pre-university, right? And so, a post-secondary, in my opinion, a post-secondary syllabus is needed. What's been happening all these years, I don't know whether there are Form 6 teachers here, we prepare students to sit for the MUET exam. And it comes back to that point I was trying to make, teaching to the test. Now, if we have a post-secondary syllabus, what should that syllabus do? It should be preparing students for university education. The syllabus should, for example, encompass the ability of students uh, to, to read multiple texts, bring ideas together to write a piece of paper. I'm sure they're doing that already in, in Form 6, right, in, in, in uh, the other subjects. But this is where uh, a, a Form 6 uh, English language syllabus is warranted. If we anchor it closely to the MUET exam, I feel that we are confining the teaching of English at the post-secondary level to just what is going to be tested. And let's keep in mind, the, the MUET exam is, is a proficiency assessment, right? The students are heading for university. They, it's an opportunity for English language teachers in the post-secondary, uh, at the post-secondary level, to really expose them 
to the demands of communication uh, in, in higher learning institutions, not just in Malaysian public institutions, but possibly overseas as well, right? Listening to, to lectures, you know, taking notes, uh, having, uh, you know, group discussions. If, and, and I think this has been the practice in the past, I mean, I've, even in university, we do prepare students for the MUED, right? We receive students at diploma level after Form 5. And I have been, uh, been teaching courses like that. And what do we do? It's pretty much drilling, right? So we have the MUED format for speaking, student A, student B, student C, student D. And then there's all this practice, constant practice for the assessment. I'm not saying that's bad, but, well, I am saying it's bad. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm saying that, that, you know, you can't spend an entire year, a year and a half in post-secondary just preparing for that exam. It should be preparing the, the, the student for uh, English language communication in higher learning institutions. I think that will be a more effective way of spending time in the post-secondary. Yes, Dr. Abdullah, what do you have to say about this? <laughs> Let's take Muad away from the system. All right. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the chance uh, to defend <laughs> uh, Muet, uh, Dr. B. Uh, one of the reasons why Dr. B was ribbing me was because uh, I am one of the people who, uh, who, one of the people who's part of the team who created the CFR Muet. It's our baby. So any talk of taking it away, I'm going to go to war. <laughs> now, uh, I'm not saying that Dr. Ramesh is wrong, and far from it. And in fact, it's one of the things, quite some time back when I was a teacher, uh, one of the things which I felt was, was missing was the very fact that Muet, there was no standardized curriculum for, for uh, post-secondary. It's basically, this is the Muet, <laughs> I'm just sharing with you how, how when I first started teaching, how they gave it to me. This is the book, <laughs> boom, teach. That, that was it. And if that is what Dr. Ramesh was saying needs to stop, I totally agree. I totally agree with not teaching to the test if the Muet test was seen as an achievement test. Now, this is something which is very, very important, yeah? When, a bit of background, what's the difference between an achievement test and a proficiency test? Some people may be a little bit um, unclear. An achievement test is basically a test that is designed to see whether you have learned everything in the curriculum that you have learned. That's achievement. Proficiency is, are you able to function in the language? That's basically it. So Muet is a proficiency test, which was what uh, Dr. Ramesh was saying just now. It's not the problem in the Muet. Why do I say this? Now, as a uh, as uh, one of the people responsible for MUET, I'm always asked the question, doctor, how do I study for MUET? Always. Doctor, what should I focus on? Should I focus on saying this? Do I need to say bombastic words? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? And, and I hear these things all the time, and my answer is always the same. Now, uh, this is especially because there was a, a change in format, right? Because we changed three years ago, and that, that time was a little bit uncertain for many people. They were all going like, oh, it's a different format. I don't know the new format, therefore I'm going to fail. And I just kept on telling them, you don't care. You're not supposed to care what the format is. The format is not the test. The format is a vehicle. The test is there just to test whether you're able to communicate in the language and to what extent. A1, A, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, that's pretty much it. 
What that means is, if you learn language as a skill, as language skill, not as a subject that you need to memorize, memorize the format, memorize this, memorize that, then it doesn't matter what exam you take, you're going to get the same. And the most beautiful part, why we work so hard, the team at MPM work so hard at aligning the MUET with CFR is what I, I love Dr. Ramesh's phrase. We're speaking the same language. So we're speaking the same language to the whole country. We're speaking the same language to people all around the world where we're saying that at this level, we can do this. At this level, we can do that. At that level, we can do this. So it's gone a bit of a roundabout. But what I'm saying here is that it's not the muet, but rather it's the way that students are being trained and taught, where the emphasis should be train and teach for proficiency, not train and teach to pass the muet. So muet is not the evil. The evil is the conception that the muet is an achievement test, a test that you can pass by memorizing formulas. For any proficiency test, that's the worst thing that can happen. So I think we need to unlearn this a little bit and then embrace muet. <laughs> thank you, Dr. B. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so we have about five minutes. Uh, if there are any questions from the floor, I would love to uh, yeah, hear from you so that we can uh, have a conversation with you. If there's any question that you would like the panel to address, Yes. Ma'am, you can come forward. Yeah. Hello. All right, a very good evening. Um, a very interesting um, discussion on assessment. But since we have the CFR MUAT expert here, I actually have a question, okay, regarding the different um, proficiency test for English. Okay, by the name, um, by the way, my name is Ko Chung Wei from IPGK Batulintang. Okay, so regarding um, the different proficiency, English proficiency tests, right, that have been aligned to CFR, my question is that, are they all created equal? So for example, let's say the SPM English 1019 is actually aligned to CFR, and like you have said, it is um, pitched at the B1 level, all right? I mean, that is supposed to be at the B1 level, but it has been um, certified at the C1 level, I think, for those who get an A+. Plus. Um, and we have Aptis, which can go all the way, like Aptis Advanced, which can get, go all the way up to, let's say, C2. Then we have Muet, that is pitched up to a C1 plus level. Let's say if I take one student, and that student is from a B1 SPM, and that same student take MUET at the same time, let's say, imagine if that's possible, right? Take MUET at the same time, and at the same time, sit for Aptis Advanced as well. So will that particular um, student get a B1 or certified at the B1 level for all the three tests? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna answer this, and I know Dr. Ramesh is itching to say something, um, because we've been fighting about this uh, in meetings. <laughs> Not amongst ourselves, but with other people. Um, very interesting question. So, your question was, are proficiency tests created equal, basically, right? And I would say yes and no. I've gotta be very careful wording formulating my words because I don't want to make enemies of lembaga peperiksaan. <laughs> so I'm going to be very, very careful here, yeah? Um, now, if, if you talk about tests that are specifically proficiency tests, muet, 
Aptis, um, to TOEFL, IELTS, these are, these are specifically proficiency tests. SPM is not a proficiency test. SPM is an achievement test, and SPM is norm-referenced, not criterion-referenced. This is one of the, one of the biggest uh, differentiators that we have to, we have to be aware of. Uh, as a refresher, what is norm-referencing and what is criterion-referencing? So norm-referencing basically means it's a curve, and uh, for example, if the whole country scores low, the curve is shifted. So, so the calculation is the A's and B's and whatever, that's not A's and B's, that's not real A's and B's, that's just A's and B's compared to the other people in the country. Whereas, if you talk about criterion referencing, which is where, what we do for in the proficiency tests, it means to say that it measures, can you do this, can you do that? If you can't do this, you're not gonna get the mark. If you can do this, you get the mark. A, B, C is based totally, purely on your, on your proficiency, not so much of the norm referencing. So that's, that's one, yeah? Now, the other one is, when you talk about pitching, because you mentioned the word pitching, pitching is the holy grail. Pitching is the only, not the only thing, but it's the most important thing when you talk about assessments. Because if you pitch an exam at a certain level, most of your questions are going to be at that level. Your marking is going to be at that level. So for SPM, what's the pitching? B, B1. So B1, the majority of the questions have been pitched there. So when we're asked, are they B1? We can know for certain, not for certain, but very, 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 you know, it's very strong indicator they're B1. Why? Because the questions are pitched at that level. However, some people, they answer that and they go beyond that. This is where we approximate that they are above B1. Maybe they're B2, maybe they're a C1. It's an approximation. Now, again, this is why I'm saying, I'm not saying that what they have, I'm not saying that that student, when they take SPM, does not necessarily, if they get the C1, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not at C1 or they are at C1. It's an approximation. Now, when you talk about the other tests, the, the, the proficiency tests that are designed to gauge proficiency, these tests have been pitched at that level. They have questions that are at that level. They have questions at B2 level. They have questions at B1 level. They have questions at C1 level. If you answer the C1 question and you answer it according to the specifications, therefore, you are at C1 because of the pitching. So I think the, the biggest takeaway from this is that when they take SPM and because SPM has been pitched at B1, are they at B1? We can definitely say they're at B1. But if they do better, you could say that they are better than B1, they're probably at B2. There, it's a strong indication. Or there is a strong indication that they're at C1. However, is it certain? In my opinion, you can't really say for certain because the pitching is not there. So that's my take on the matter. I hope I clarified it. I think uh, Dr. Ramesh wants to say something as well. We have time. Right. I suppose the question was whether a student who sits for, uh, a student who receives, let's say, a C1 in Muet uh, will also receive a C1 if the student was to sit for an Aptis uh, assessment. That was the question. You know, even if we take Muet out of the, the question and we look at more established uh, 
assessment uh, centers like the ETS, for example, you will find that they run multiple TOEFL assessments. You have TOEFL, TOEFL IBT, TOEFL ITP, uh, you know, TOEFL, which is pitched for students uh, who are younger, can't remember what the terms are. And they all are multi-level assessments, which tell you that the student, that, you know, students would receive uh, anything between an A1 to a, to a C, C1 or C2, right? Um, will the student definitely receive the same uh, assessment? Not necessarily. Uh, I mean, the, the same uh, level. Not necessarily. The, the defense on their side could be that, you know, on that day, it so happened that the candidate did better than, than when the candidate said for the other test. Um, but of course, there, you know there are many other variables as well. Uh, when, you, when you look at speaking, assessing speaking, for example, the assessors themselves need to be experienced. And I know that this is one of the issues with, with uh, the MUET now, right? Because there is this uh, concern that the assessors uh, are not as experienced as they should be because the MUET is a new assessment. And so perhaps, uh, you know, you'd be better off sitting for an IELTS assessment. Um, but I think the decision is pretty much for the receiving institution to make. So, you know, as uh, while these assessments are out there for us to choose, it is up to uh, the receiving institutions. For example, if our student is going to the UK, the student has no choice but to sit for an IELTS assessment, right? Whereas in our public universities, they accept MUET or they accept IELTS and TOEFL. You know, it really depends on, on who is, I think, I think Abdullah would agree as well. You know, when we receive postgraduate students uh, from overseas in our in our, our local universities, they come in with uh, TOEFL uh, uh, grades, but somehow that doesn't seem to translate into uh, their capacity to to manage the academic tech. So, um, with all assessments, you know, I think that there is that room for for uh, inaccuracies in. in in terms of you know how the student performs. Okay, Dr. Ramesh, thank you. Any other question from the floor? Yeah. Hi. Good evening, Dr. Ramesh and Dr. Abula. Hi. One. Uh, how do I say, um, as a parent, I'm not here as a teacher. Okay, like both. Okay, both, vice versa, okay? Um, when it comes to assessment itself, this classroom-based assessment, my one question that always that comes in my mind, because I see things, I, I, we do come across being teachers and whatnot, to what extent the credibility and the integrity plays a role when it just now, Dr. Ramesh, you mentioned about professional judgment. So, when I see this student, to me, he might be probably a three, probably to me, or uh, okay, a two. But to another teacher, he might be, okay, if the teacher's proficiency level is not to that extent, probably to her it's, wow, right? Aren't we doing justice to our children now? Aren't we doing justice to a certain extent? Because what might be good to me might not be good to another teacher. And this professional judgment that we are coming, we all wouldn't allow anything to come across my professional ethics. Like nobody can question my credibility because you know we are, we are there. We know that nobody should, you know. But we, we see things. We see things. And these are things that are happening in schools. Off record, please. But yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I, yeah, You're going live, live, you know. <laughs> okay, never mind. So, yeah, the whole world hears. <laughs> right. So, yeah. To what extent, and I believe to a certain extent, we are doing justice to the children. What do you all think about this? Thank you. Okay, I think this, is, this has been, uh, you know, in the media as well, where school teachers have suggested that they have been uh, forced to uh, award, uh, what is that, TP, is it TP, right? The performance standards, right? Uh, the maximum performance standard, uh, simply rather instructive, right? So if a student does not have TP6, therefore you have failed. You know, it's, it's going, unfortunately, 
as we try to run away from, from you know, uh, teaching to the test and, and you know, uh, uh, looking at grades, uh, we get pulled back because this need to use these performance standards uh, are across all subjects. So for English, by right, if the student has achieved the minimum, that means the student is on target. Right? TP, is it TP4? Minim, tahap minima is what? Uh, three or four? Three, right? So if the student is there, the student is on target. Beyond that, the student is, is much better, right? It, it, it's done, has shown evidence that the student is higher than where, where the student needs to be. But unfortunately, parents come in, are probably breathing down your necks as well as uh, you know, other administrators say, how can you award uh, the child uh, TP3? So to be honest, I feel that your, your guide is the learning standards. For example, if you have listening and you have, I don't know how many listening, for listening, how many learning standards are there in a year? About six maybe, am I right? I don't know. Let's say there are about six learning standards for listening, just one scale, right? At the end of the year, as a teacher, are you able to say that this student is able to do this, do this, do this, do this? Are you able to say that with confidence? If you're able to say that using your professional judgment, I feel that's the way I would ascertain whether the student is on target. This need to use the, the performance standards, uh, um, yeah, I've, I've had conversations about this. But uh, what I understand is it is something which is required because it's done across all subjects. Uh, but as English language teachers, we know that we want our students to be on target. If you have students who, are, who can do more with the language than what the student needs to do, that's fantastic. But if a student is on target as a teacher, I would say you've done your job, right? And you know, you're not burdening, well, it's, Sorry, wrong choice of word. But the teacher who receives the student the next year can pick up from where you, 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 you have left off. But if the student is not there, then I don't know. I, I keep thinking of the, of the learning standards. You should be able to tell the teacher, look, for this particular skill, these are learning standards that the, student, the child has achieved, but this is where the student is struggling with. So please you know, keep that in mind as you take this child through uh, the next year. That's that's the hope. That's my hope anyway. But yeah, I, we we understand the challenges with the with the performance standards uh, which are being used. Um, I've just got a bit to add on to that. So I believe in your question, you were you were talking about validity, reliability, and so on. Yeah. So so again, this is it's a double-edged sword. When you want to introduce those terms, then you're coming, then you are signaling back to the second coming of uh, summative exams. <laughs> so we need summative exams. And to a certain extent, that's the reason why summative exams are there. They're, they're there because summative exams have gone through the rigor. They have, the, in Muet, for example, you know, you have, you have the, the training of the examiners, many levels, they go for centralized training, and then they go for state training, and all that's just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So, I think my answer here is going to be divided into two parts. Number one is the first part, which is, at school level, you wanna make sure that they can achieve what they're supposed to do. So, tahap pengusahaan, that's fine, so they do that. But then again, it, it, and I don't think it should really matter that fine tuning between A and B, like whatever, you know. One to six, whether they're at six or five. The one that you're really interested in is that tahap good, whether they can, they can do it or not. And if they're there, that's, that's the concern. You make sure you hit that, then it should be okay. Everything should be, you know, they've, they've done what they're supposed to do. It's, a, it's now a matter of educating the schools, educating the parents, that getting that eager is not a failure. 
Somehow in our society, if you don't get six, you're a failure. <laughs> so uh, another thing which, which really is detrimental is the fact that we are competing against each other. Um, students have to compete against it. The, the grading, we, we're grading. Dalam class, dapat nombor berapa? That's always the thing, right? Dapat nombor berapa? So the students are, are pitched against each other. It's not a cooperative learning environment. It's a competitive learning environment. The schools are pitched against each other. That school is better than this school. That school is better than this school. And that sort of um, environment needs to be uh, rethought because it's not ideal for learning. First part of the question, done. Second part is, you want to test how good they are really? Take the standardized test at the end. So there's a combination between those two. <laughs> and they should live in, in harmony, yeah. formative and summative. Okay, that's Thank you. My Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, I think we have crossed over uh, 20 minutes extra. Uh, if there's one last question from the floor, I think we can take. Otherwise, I will sum up this session for tonight. Is there any other questions? Thank you. Right. So, um, picking up from the last question from the audience just now on credibility. I think uh, credibility is something that you build over time. Okay, and this is very much related to the other concept that uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh talked about on making professional judgment. And how you make professional judgment is by being, by being literate in your assessment skills. So, it's all related. And we talked about how Finland is so successful, but remember, it took one decade for the country to be where it is now. Okay, if you Google and read what it's very interesting. But a lot of empowerment is given to the teachers in Finland. And I think what we are doing in Malaysia now is that we are giving that empowerment to teachers. That's why we are talking about formative assessment. And what's more important now is that we need to make it as a culture. Assessment should become a culture. And teachers... It's not clear, is it? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I think what's important now is that we need to build that culture among us that to understand what we are doing. Many a times we know we, we fail because we don't take time to understand. And for any policy, any system to be successful, you need to allow it to grow. You cannot achieve something within an overnight or within a year. We need to give it time to grow. We need to grow with the system as well. Now, having said that, I thank you again for, on the behalf of the organizing committee for being with us tonight and to share the thoughts on assessment. Thank you very much to the panel as well. No? Okay. Uh, a warm round of applause to uh, Pro Assistant Professor Dr. Ramesh Nair, Dr. Abdullah Mamad Nawi, and Dr. Vanita. Assessment in, uh, sorry. Assessment in current times and its way forward, a very interesting topic yeah, for the evening. And we hope, we hope that the discussion this evening helps to clear the misconceptions surrounding the definition, objectives, as well as the implementation of assessments in this country, both formative and summative assessments, uh, as well as the difference between achievement tests and proficiency tests, as well as norm reference and criterion reference tests. Yeah, Dr. Abdullah? Okay, moving away from rote learning or teach to the test requires full understanding, as mentioned by Dr. Vanita just now, and a par paradigm shift, not just from teachers and students, but also from parents and the community at large. Thank you once again, dear esteemed uh, speakers, for such insightful and engaging discussion today and uh, on the opinions on, on assessment and its way forward. With that, ladies and gentlemen, this session concludes our final program for day two of the second International Conference on English Language ISEL 2022.
Do join us again tomorrow for more interesting session and the closing ceremony of ICEL 2022. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us in this special interest group session on assessment. Goodbye for now and good night. Thank you.